So is, is Carl next to you or is he on the end? Oh, Joellen's not good. Joellen Zuman. So maybe Carl would want to sit next to you rather than being on the end. Oh, thank you. Got my old chair back. Carl, Joellen. Is this your, your old seat? It's, yeah. Should I just keep passing him down? I haven't oh, brought okay. my mask. That's, How about that? That's a good idea. I don't know. Pardon me? Did your back spasm yeah. when you No, it when you rest? No, it's basically my leg either works or doesn't work. Okay. okay. And I never know when I get up. Yeah. Sarah? Yes. So Chuck is not gonna be here. Do you want us to pull this chair so you guys could have more space? Sure, we can do that. Okay. Um, we can just set it back here yeah. and then I, I need to get out at one point though. So oh okay. Um, how about if we slide it this way? Musical chairs. <laughs> Make a motion, we adjourn. <laughs> we'll get this, fig get we'll get this figured you. out. After. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> after a scale. We're kind of rusty at it. The right shortest now. meeting I was ever involved in last time was seven tonight? minutes. She is online. Really? She's yeah. zooming. She ended up in. Uh, <laughs> ended up in emergency. Hi. How's it going? Yeah. Good. How are you? Doing good. Good to see you. Yes, nice to see you guys. Good. Greetings, neighbor. Hey. Hey, how are you doing? I think you're right here. Well, you can sit wherever you want. But oh, okay. I think they put you here. We can always move the name tags. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> my high school diploma so came in over just like that. How are you oh, doing? Yeah. Long time no see. I know. I've been good, staying busy. How are you? Uh, good. You doing the sunshine? It's doing nothing great. Yeah. <laughs> Just working on the lawn. And <laughs> keeping it green? Trying to keep it green. Well, it's I, be actually, I am. We, we cheat. I have a well. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it nice. So, is this the number you were expecting to show up on site? Um, well, I was expecting two to be out and two is, two are out. So Joellen's on Zoom, as is Chuck. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me. Hi, Chuck. And I'm not sure. Is was. I don't know, Carl. I can't see if. Um, He's up there. Is he up there? Okay. So Carl, I guess, will be zooming in too. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, shall we social distance? <laughs> well, that's, yeah, I mean, that's up to you. Whatever you're comfortable with, Glenn. I can move down if you want. No, I'm fine. I can move down. You can just move a chair out of the way and slide down one. Yeah, I'm up to you. I was inoculated in yeah. January and February, so <laughs> I got the vaccine, too. We can hold it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just so it's so better, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to be socially correct, yeah. Come on. Don't do that. I show six PM, Mayor, oh. just FYI. Okay. All right, so um, it is 6 p.m., uh, August 11th. Recording in progress. I am Mayor Julia Johnson, and this is our first in-person hybrid council meeting. I welcome all of you who have um, come to uh, be a part of this uh, meeting this evening. Uh, if you will all stand with me to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So I knew Chuck and Joellen wouldn't be here with us. Um, and so I'll begin with them. Uh, Chuck, if you just for the record can let us know you're here. 
Madam Mayor, I'm present. Thank you. Via Zoom. Thank you. I didn't check. We didn't hear you if you had your mic on. Is he up there? He should be up there. He was up there. And Mr. DeYoung, I see you are also Zooming in tonight. Council Member DeYoung is here. Okay. So. All right. And Councilman Loy. Here. And Councilwoman Diamond. Present. Councilman McGoffin. Present. And Councilman Allen. Present. Okay. Thank you. So I am looking for an approval of the agenda. Do Madam I Mayor, I make an approval. Or I make a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Do I have a second? Madam Mayor, I'll, Councilman Allen, I'll second that. All right, thank you. So we have a motion by Councilman McGoffin, seconded by Councilman Allen. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. So moving on, that passes. Moving on to the consent agenda, items one through five. Again, looking for a motion. I'll make that motion, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Loy. Second. Thank you, Councilman McGoffin. So we have a motion by Councilman Loy, seconded by Councilman McGoffin. Any discussion? All in favor by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same aye. sign. Okay. So we have a swearing in. Chief Tucker, did um, Seth want to be here this evening? Or did you? Want to come out, but <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come around. <laughs> Is that one of your new babies, Chief? I, Seth O. Bass. I, Seth O. Bass. Do solemnly swear that I am a citizen of the United States. Do solemnly swear that I am a citizen of the United States. And of the state of Washington. And of the state of Washington. That I will support the Constitution and the laws of the United States. That I will support the Constitution and the laws of the United States. And the Constitution and the laws of the state of Washington. And the Constitution and the laws of the state of Washington. And I will do to the best of my judgment skill and ability and I will do to the best of my judgment skill and ability truly faithfully and impartially perform truly faithfully and impartially perform all the duties of a police officer all the duties of a police officer in and for the city of Cedar Woolley Skagit County Washington in and for the city of Cedar Woolley Skagit County Washington as such are the duties prescribed by law as such are the duties prescribed by law so help me God so help me God congratulations Thank you. Can I shake your hand? Absolutely. So while they're signing, um, just to let you all know, uh, Seth just got out of the academy on Friday. Um, and I did not go down to the graduation because it's a drive to graduation. Um, but uh, he's hitting the road. He's on the road today. Mm -hmm. He's working with Sergeant Eaton for the Thank first you. week. Uh, yeah. first, three, Welcome aboard. first three weeks. So nice. the Sergeant not only has lots of stuff to do, but he's mm -hmm. got. He's got a cute kid. He's, he's, got, a, he's got a help <laughs> She there. takes after her mother. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank, Thank you so all. Thank you. So that's fantastic. Okay. I think we'll have um, one more who might be coming out of the academy soon. Wonderful. All right, so we will move on to um, staff reports, and I will begin with you, Chief Wagner. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, just wanted to uh, reiterate to folks that the temperatures are going to be increasing again this week. We're going to see 
temperatures in the 90s and close to 100, it sounds like. Uh, so stay hydrated. Uh, use the life jackets if the kids are out in the water. And uh, along with that, we had some uh, good things happening this week. We had uh, our official badge painting to catch up to the last uh, couple years of promotions and uh, uh, firefighters that have made their probation. So we had firefighter Steve Cole, firefighter Brandon Paulson, and firefighter Tyler Coffell that were sworn in on uh, Monday night. Thank you, Mayor, as well as promotions of Lieutenants Troy Hansen, Michael Mejia, Aaron Bontrager, and Bobby Castilea, uh, Captains Ariel Wesson, Captain uh, Keith Ford, and our two new assistant chiefs, Jerry and Glenn Gardner. Um, with that, uh, the news from uh, the fire end of the, the building has been uh, all uh, related to new uh, processes and things that are happening from the government. House Bill 1310 uh, and working well with our uh, partners over with Tucker and his crew on how the ripple effects affect fire and EMS. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Sergeant Eaton coming in next Monday night to talk to our crews and work together as far as uh, how we're going to approach the crises that we have as far as the mental health and how we've got to do the new normal working forward and how that affects all of us. Um, as well as the new proclamation that just came forward from the governor's office on uh, mandatory vaccinations uh, and working on the language and the communication out to uh, our folks here at the department uh, that didn't we didn't quite realize that uh, the proclamation was going to reach down to fire and ems uh, uh, but now uh, knowing that it affects us how that's going to uh, work with the 40 some folks we have on staff and and getting those people vaccinated or uh, communicating out to them on what our uh, uh, expectations are before the October 18th deadline. So it's going to be uh, some uh, definite change and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, um, partnerships. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam moving Mayor, on. this is Councilmember DeYoung. I have a question for Chief. Go ahead. Yes. yes, sir. Go ahead. Hey, Frank, uh, I was wondering how many folks does this affect of, that need to be uh, vaccinated to get compliance? What's the number, please? Well, uh, we're, we're not totally sure uh, with the mask mandates. One of the things that we uh, requested over the last few months was attestation statements of folks that had uh, either chose to get vaccinated and didn't want to wear a mask, as well as uh, those that uh, uh, could decline to answer either way per our uh, DOH and uh, local uh, medical program director's advice. And with that, we have 20, uh, uh, two of our 45 uh, folks on the roster right now are confirmed with vaccination and uh, 23 that are kind of in limbo that we're not sure on. And uh, we want to reach out to those folks and, and see because they've never really had to mandatorily uh, uh, prove that to us. But now with this new proclamation, they've got to come in, bring a copy of their uh, uh, vaccination card or a note from the doctor saying they've got it, or uh, we're not allowed to have them uh, uh, operate in uh, EMS capacity or on calls uh, going forward after October 18th. So it could be some serious growing pains for us if uh, uh, we have, I mean, we have some pretty key folks that are on that list of of the gray area of what ifs. Thank you, Chief Wagner. Chief Wagner, I have a you, question. And I know that this may be uh, something you're not able to answer, but what is, what is the likelihood of um, medical, um, uh, medical passes outside of the vaccination? Say you have people that have had COVID, can prove they have the antibodies, they're naturally <coughs> vaccinated by all intensive purposes, but don't have the shot and don't have that piece of paper. Um, have, you, have you addressed that and, and gone down that alley yet? If that question was for me, I could not understand or hear you. Uh... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's hard with the mask on. Um, my question was, how or if, if you've investigated the alleyway into maybe some people on the department that have, have had COVID 
that have had their antibodies tested do have the antibodies um, confirming that they then are naturally vaccinated for all intensive purposes, naturally immune, um, and how the department might deal with that or if there's any sort of, um, any, any sort of, of medical guidelines or papers work that can be provided for those key employees, you know, every single person on that department is key and every single person de deserves to have the opportunity to be a part of our great community and they have been serving from day one through all of this when everybody is calling and they're taking risks and, and you know, some of them have obtained COVID and have the antibodies and if they can prove that they have it with an have built immunities with their antibody tests, my question is: Has this has the state provided you with any sort of direction on that? Yeah, this uh, question has come up over the last few months from providers before this proclamation has even uh, uh, been brought forward. And the answer we continue to get is: There's there's nothing in any of these uh, statutes or or proclamations that cover that at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, again, with this one, we, we have nothing on paper that shows any avenue for us to, to utilize that as <coughs> the proof of vaccination either. Okay. That was a great question. And on the minds of a lot of people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Chief Tucker. Got it. Um, just a couple of things here. We've got Seth on board. Thank you very much for getting him sworn in tonight. I appreciate that. We have Isaiah off to the academy. He's off to the academy in uh, uh, Spokane right now. I'm looking forward to seeing how that's turned out. We've never had one in Spokane Academy. I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of training he gets out of there. Um, uh, I'm going to be on vacation starting tomorrow through the next week. Uh, we're going to be a little short staffed. I've got a sergeant and uh, two sergeants are going to be kind of covering uh, any calls or concerns that come up. And both myself and Lieutenant McElwraith, who's also out of town, will be available by phone. Um, we've both been deferring some vacations for a while. And we kind of perfect storm, uh, unfortunately, at the same time. And um, one other thing that um, since Frank brought up the mandates for vaccinations for his folks, we had a, uh, a mandate from our training commission. And before uh, with that was Councilwoman Diamond that was asking the question earlier about, um, you know, any studies or anything like that. Um, There's no logic to this one either. Um, the We had a mandate from our training commission that we are to sign a uh, basically an authorization to access our social media. This went to all 12,000 law enforcement officers that qualify in the state of Washington. And we have to sign this mandate or this uh, consent form by uh, October, I think it's 22nd or the end of October, or we face decertification and loss of job. So the, um, I think they're kind of upping the ante a little bit. Um, on uh, a lot of us in um, in the emergency services. Um, this shouldn't have been a surprise, but it really was the way it came across. And it was with one of those uh, one of the one of those thirteen bills that came up that um, we've been uh, analyzing. In all honesty, it's not a huge issue. It's just the um, I guess the the way it was put out. Um, if you have social media, and there's some reason for the uh, Office of Independent Investigation to investigate one of our officers, then they have gotten the forced consent signature saying that they can access our uh, social media. That does not allow them to get a log into our social media, but it does allow them to um, take any information on any social media platform we have and use that during the decertification process if that's the course they're going. It's just kind of a disturbing uh, direction um, that we're continuing down. Uh, hopefully we'll find out more uh, later on this. Uh, our attorney, Nikki, was on the phone with, with um, myself and some other uh, labor attorneys for WCIA and uh, some of the other chiefs and sheriff's employees 
uh, talking about some of the things that are coming down the road for us. In all honesty, this last legislative session has not been uh, kind to us. And the real frustrating part is that it wasn't very clear either. Um, we're actually pretty good at taking pretty clear direction, but we haven't got a lot of clear direction in some of the things that were handed down to us. So we're gonna keep you updated as soon as we find more information. Um, we're plowing through this. We've got 12,000 officers um, on one side of the spectrum here uh, going through this. And now you got the fire department um, kind of slogging through some of this with us, as well as going through their own issues. So um, we'll keep you posted on what's going on. And with that, that's all I have, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if you wanted to address at all some of the situations that have arose with uh, some of our community members who call regarding mental health calls, uh, things like that. I know that you're receiving a lot of criticism because you have not been able to answer those calls. So I'm going to give you opportunity here to kind of address why that is that you're not able to do that. Sure. Um, we've, um, you know, we get, we're getting exactly the same thing that agencies are getting across the, the state. Um, there's concern um, coming from all ends of the spectrum um, that, um, you know, what do we do? Well, in all honesty, it's mostly business as usual. And what I've been passing on, what I passed on to the school district in a presentation I did to them in the last couple of days is that we just have to be very cautious in our approach. We're going to spend more time asking questions. Dispatch will spend more time asking questions and we will be just looking at our response a little, little more um, than we have before. We've already started um, not going to some aid calls that it's not clear that we should be there. And when Frank mentioned that having uh, Sergeant Eaton come in and talk, uh, Frank and I and uh, one of the one of the assistant chiefs had a I should say assistant chief Gardner that covers both of them. Um, we're having a talk the other day, and uh, it, this came up that um, we want to have a consistency of response from the police to the things that the fire need us for. We are not going to leave them hanging. Um, when there is something that's clearly a need for us to respond to. So um, what, we're, what we want to do is to get together and discuss some of the things that we can't go to, because for the most part, if we have, you know, a, um, uh, a life-threatening type event, those are the kind of things that we want officers going to. What we're facing right now is with all of these changes coming from Olympia, we have officers saying, well, what am I exactly supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And I've got officers with 10, 15 years of experience that have some level of confusion on that. And I don't really expect an officer with six months to a year on to be able to navigate that any better. So we're trying to work through some of these things. We're trying to look through all of these um, legislative things. We've got attorneys. Nikki's been looking through this stuff. We've got the WCIA attorney that gave us a briefing today, gave a very good informational briefing, some really good points for us to consider. And um, we're working as a group. I'm gonna be with the Fraternal Order of Police all next week in Indianapolis, um, going over some of the same issues that we're experiencing nationwide. So we're still trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And that's, I guess, the basic direction. We're hearing from some of the legislators that introduced this legislation that law enforcement is misinterpreting um, the statutes that they've come up with that they believe are very clear. But what we're also seeing is they're not very clear and we're having attorneys going, we don't know what to tell you. So we'll give you some, you know, the best advice we can get you, but there's still so many things up in the air and so many questions that are still left unanswered that we none of us have all the answers. But we're gonna still be serving the people as best we can. We're gonna default towards handling calls and There'll just be a few that we'll have to back away from, not because we can't handle them, but because we're pretty much being told that that's the best way to do it is to not handle them. And that's it. Okay. And for the record, we're not the only police department that is um, speaking out regarding this. This is uh, across the state. Is that correct? <clears throat> that's correct. There's actually been some uh, a wrong way crash on I-5, I think, or on some interstate that officers did not pursue the subject because they didn't have all the requirements. There was a school bus that had been stolen by somebody, some guy in a dress that had some mental or drug issues 
that um, crashed into a house over in Chelan County. Um, there's been a lot of other issues. We've had small issues that um, uh, Frank being on top of um, some of the concerns that his crews are having that we're addressing before they become an issue. Um, but, you know, we we had an incident today. It really didn't, it wasn't affected by some of the new legislation, but it was a pursuit, the subject that left, uh, took off on officers, about rammed one of the officers. We were probably going to be okay if we got in a pursuit with him, but the officers really weren't sure if they could or not. And we had all the best information we had available, myself and Sergeant Eaton were on. Um, we found the car a little bit later, it had been abandoned, and we did a canine track and did not locate the subject. We're experiencing kind of uh, the, the lower end of uh, the problems with these new le this new legislation. Some of the big cities have had serious issues. People's lives have been lost, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Okay. And also you want to maintain your certification, is that not correct? Because if you're found to be in fault of these new laws, there is that concern that you could, you know, end your career as a police officer simply because you didn't interpret the law correctly. That's correct. That twice a month economic stimulus check that uh, the city provides all of us um, for showing up every day is coming in pretty handy and we want to keep that going. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Chief Tucker. Um, Director of Building and Permits, John Coleman. Evening, Council, Mayor, thank you. So um, things are busy as usual down in the Planning and Building Department. Um, we're still short-staffed, uh, you know, only have a part-time uh, building inspector and plans examiner, and we're still looking to replace Tony. Uh, we uh, did... Uh, hire the new assistant planner, and Nicole started on Monday. So we are uh, beginning the process of unburying from the, the mound of planning issues, uh, uh, permits and things that we do down there. Uh, there will be a, a, grow, a, a slowdown as we train new staff and get up to speed. So um, just uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, just... Uh, things are busy at the moment, and that's about all really we have to report is uh, things are just very busy. John, could you share actually with the council what uh, your staff is looking at as far as new housing, actually new living units that are um, currently permitted and what you expect by the end of the year? Um, well, I, I, what I can tell you is uh, we've received about uh, 118 building residential building permit applications this year. Um, most of those are in the three uh, plats that are that are being built. Um, out, went out on uh, Independence, or not Independence. I'm sorry, out on McGarrigal, um the Brickyard Park. So the, they're they're building a, a lot of homes out there at the moment. And then uh, out at Carriage Court, there's several units being built. Uh, excuse me, not Carriage Court, Cambridge Commons, which is on the north end of town on, on Jones Road. And then on North Trail Road in between Jones and uh, FNS Grade Road, there's also the, the new subdivision going there. So that's where most of the, the new units are being built, as well as in the Urban Village mixed use area, there's the 76 unit uh, mixed with uh, commercial on the downstairs that's under construction right now. So um, as everybody knows, the real estate market is doing really well right now. Um, housing is uh, still uh, at a premium. So uh, there's a lot of development interest in building uh, new homes. And so uh, we had ramped up to, to address this and had planned for it. And now we're seeing it come. So this is, not a surprise or something that is um, unexpected. It's uh, just we're we're in it now, so we're we're uh, doing the building inspections and processing the permits. 
Absolutely. I guess my point being that you're really up quite a bit from most years, that this year is an exception to the rule. And what you're yeah, anticipating, um, you what know, you're for, anticipating by so the end of the year, year will be even this more. This year we are seeing at least twice as many uh, building permits received as we did in the previous year and the previous year before that. Um, now, uh, in previous years, there, we did have a shortage of lots. So that was potentially artificially low, the number we were receiving. But, I mean, the fact of the matter is we are seeing a, a lot more building permits this year than we have over the past, you know, at this time of the year, over the past several years. All right. Thank you, John. Moving on to Director of Public Works, Mark Freiberger. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, I have a few things on the agenda a little later to talk about, so I won't mention those, but we do have uh, our pavement, pre pavement preservation project started on Monday. Uh, the contractor is saw cutting and getting ready to uh, demolish the existing curb corners at state and township, and uh, they'll be doing that over the next few weeks. Uh, that'll be followed by the overlays on Wicker Road and on uh, Eastern uh, Street. Um, other than that, uh, the bids close tomorrow at 2 o'clock for the wastewater treatment plant laboratory operations and the public works building. So uh, our intention is to have a memorandum on the agenda for the uh, 25th of August for that, assuming we get a good contractor and good bids. Uh, the environment appears to be okay right now. Lumber prices have stabilized somewhat, and so we're looking forward to getting bids that are within our budget and, and bringing those to you on the 24th. And um, that's it for me for now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Director of IT, Bill Chambers. Uh, good evening, all. Um, we're nearing the end of the interview process to fill the IT specialist position. Uh, vacated by Glenn Gardner, and um, still doing uh, prep for the cemetery management software implementation, uh, continuing the rollout of the uh, cedrowoolly.gov domain and multi-factor authentication for email accounts, and uh, evaluating the text MyGov uh, citizen engagement um, um, platform for SMS texting. And that's it. All right. And thank you, Bill, for um, really working in a very creative way to make it possible for us to come back so that we could do, we could meet the letter of the law, which is doing hybrid and still be able to gather in person. Thank you. Director of Finance, Debbie Burton. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, City Council. Um, we too are on the hiring train. Uh, we are pleased that we have selected a candidate for our utility billing position. Um, this is a very public-facing position, does lots of customer service, and so I think you'll be very pleased with our candidate. Um, she is slated to start on August 25th, and I'll be happy to introduce her um, at that time when she, when she begins her work. So um, as a reminder, Christine is leaving at the end of the month, and so Serena has been working diligently um, trying to get up to speed on all the tasks while still covering all of her duties that she's currently doing. So I just want to give Serena a shout out this evening because um, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so um, we're just looking forward to getting our reservation system for parks and some of our buildings online. Um, Trina has done an amazing job of getting those forms um, set up for us. So I will be demoing that for council when we're um, ready to go so that you can understand how that all will work. So thank you. Thank you. And I, I want to give a shout out to Christine because I know she's working on the uh, cemetery project, that new um, program that we have, and that is a lot of work. So thank you, Debbie. Yes. Um, City Attorney Nikki Thompson. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, City Council. Um, I also have a lot on the agenda tonight for me anyhow, so I will not take up additional time now. I will wait till later. All right. Thank you, Nikki. And our city supervisor, Doug Merriman, is on vacation this week. So we'll move on to uh, council member reports. And I will begin with Councilman Loy. Well, the one thing I'd like to speak about is something that's been going on. We've been working since March 10th on the uh, recycling problem. And it's been uh, Joelle and me and Glenn are the utilities committee. And then we've been working with Doug. And we're coming close to 
coming up with a solution and coming back to the city council, but I just wanted you to know that we have been working on it every week and it will come to you hopefully soon. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Councilwoman Diamond. Oh, nothing at this time. All right. Thank you. Councilman McGoffin. Hi, thank you. I just want to say it's good to be back in person. And uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Nathan and his crew for all the work done on FNS Grade Road. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, and I also wanted just to give the announcement about Pat's Playground. Uh, if you haven't seen it already, there's going to be a grand opening event this Saturday uh, from 2.30 to 6. And that's over um, off of Cook Road. So uh, one question that I did receive uh, today about that was, are there going to be any bathrooms installed? We have had that suggestion, but that hasn't been discussed at all. Okay. Yeah. And that's all I have. All right. Thank you. And Councilman Allen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I talked to you the other day, and uh, I'm glad that the city's phone lines are a lot more customer friendly now. <laughs> uh, they were absolutely horrible like two weeks ago. Uh, and, and then I, I'm kind of squawking right now because that was ill-conceived on how it was set up, I think. I, we can't hear it from out here. Okay, I um, think it was kind of ill-conceived on the initial change over. Um, and then the misunderstanding on closing, it just seems like in some ways we're... Uh, shooing off the citizens of Cedar Woolley and putting them in this second-class status. You know, I mean, it's an observation. Uh, you know, the taxpayers are the ones that pay our wages and everybody else's. So, uh, you know, I think maybe sometimes we should take a deep breath and a little more thought before we implement certain policies. Well, anyway, we haven't that's, implemented that's, any of those policies. I'm only one out of seven, but I, that, that's kind of my gut feeling. So anyway, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I wholeheartedly disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Uh, Councilwoman Kesty. Thank you. I have nothing for tonight, Mayor, and I'm sorry I could not hear any of um, what Glenn was saying. Okay. So. So, Cal Councilman, <laughs> Councilwoman Kesty, I'm wondering if you wanted to talk about Blast from the Past. I know that was a conversation that we had. Did you want to bring that up at all, or is that for a later date? I think it'd be best for a later date, only till um, we can make sure all the ducks are in a row. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Councilman Owen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say, but I would. It's hard for me to uh, uh, understand those people with masks on. It's just I, I didn't hear Glenn at all, and you sound pretty good. But but most of them, the, their voice is just kind of muffled. But uh, I have no qualms, and it's too bad I'm not there. But I'm not coming there until this COVID thing uh, starts to recede, recede instead of advance. So I feel safe here. Uh, I can still do my duty here. And uh, I, I just enjoy watching you people. <laughs> so that, that's all I have, Mayor. And, and, okay. and I thank you very much. And it's good to see the council there. Well, remain safe, um, Chuck, and um, I, I do appreciate the heads up. You're letting me know that you weren't going to be here. So um, thank you. And Councilman DeYoung. Good evening. I hope you can hear me okay. Awesome. Yes. Uh, well, yes, welcome we can hear from you Ward okay. 6, and we see folks enjoying the park and the river, so please be safe in all your water sports and activities. And uh, also, Mark, uh, we know it's a hot season, and that uh, has an effect with uh, the road surfaces. So uh, I, I wish you well in tracking those down and getting those covered. And really do appreciate all the, the hard work and the uh, sweat equity that our public works puts into on, on these hot days and uh, getting things done in order to get goods and people's services in the market. 
So thank you for that. And uh, Chief Tucker, I've uh, had a neighbor on the 900 block of Fruit, uh, excuse me, of Fidalgo, 900 block of Fidalgo, uh, which would be on the uh, east side of Township, uh, speak to me about uh, speeders. And uh, I know you got an extra police officer there just to, 24 hours to help us out to, uh, to limit that. But if you could put that on your list of uh, 42 hot spots and in, uh, yep, I see it. But uh, I do want to mention, Chief, that uh, I have I have seen a patrol run through, um, uh, going through the neighborhood on Fidalgo uh, and through Ward 6 and through, uh, I guess, less uh, traveled uh, arterials to town. So that's good to see. And uh, I think people like to see that uh, as part of our community enforcement. So uh, thank you very much for a job well done. And that's my report. All right, thank you. And um, I only have a couple things tonight. The first thing that I want to say is that we do have our city scene, and we're still doing that. Our publisher during COVID um, uh, had to close their door, so we have put it online. And if you go to our website, you will be able to sign up for it, and it'll pop into either your text or your your email or both, depending upon what you want to do. But um, I would encourage you to check that out. And uh, the other thing, because I'm just a little concerned that maybe people didn't hear, me, um, perhaps speaking right into the mic, I guess, is what we have to do to be heard. So... Um, and that, that, that is uh, the celebration of Pat's Playfield, which is this Saturday. That's what uh, Councilman McGoffin was talking about. And the social hour begins at 2.30. The uh, dedication is at 3. And around 4 o'clock, there'll be um, uh, music, I do believe. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, so just so you're aware of that. All right, so let's move on now to public comments. Um, it is right now... 638, and we actually have a special guest. We have our former state senator, Kirk Pearson, here, and he is going to come up, and he wants to address the council and the public. And welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor, and good to see you all, council. And it's nice to welcome back. Uh, I know that uh, you know, everybody's been careful during this time, but uh, Actually, this was the second council meeting I've been to this week that they're doing kind of a hybrid. So congratulations, and and uh, it's kind of good to be around folks again. But, it is. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I just wanted to come by. I dropped off some pamphlets. I'm now with Volunteers of America for Western Washington. We provide a number of... Uh, Human services, and uh, and we actually cover this area. So, in some sense, I'm I'm kind of back here helping uh, helping my friends and everything. And uh, the chief brought up uh, the issue of mental health. We do have the 211 and 988 crisis lines that uh, we staff 24/7, and. Uh, we do that statewide, and we are going to be expanding it to um, tribes nationwide, too. So uh, that, we have our food banks, but those are in Snohomish County, but we do distribute food. But uh, I've left uh, a card there for one of our communication directors. If you have any questions, please feel free to give them a call. And, and uh, But please, I don't have any cards yet. This is my seventh seventh day, I think. But uh, I wanted to get back out and uh, let folks know we're here to help. But uh, please uh, use us as a resource. And if you need to call somebody, we do have some temporary emergency housing, and, and we're working on more. But, uh, but again, feel free to call us anytime. But it's good to see all of you. I'll take care. Thank you, Kirk. It's really good to see you, too. And we appreciate the, your, your continued service to the community. Well, Thank you very much. I, really quickly, I think I was here when, or I was in the old building, I, the old uh, fire hall. I used to have an office there many years ago and mm. stuff. And the poor guy that worked for me, you know, when they were starting up the fire trucks, he was saying he got a little smoky in there. But, oh, no. uh, but anyhow, it's good to be back. Thank you so much. Thank Council, you. For your service. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else for a public comment? Hello, Phil. Just for the record, please state your name and address. My name is Philip Murray. I live at 223 State Street. I also have property at 101 West Woodworth, where the city is pushing 
a road through for the library access. And I have the plat map of Woolley, the original copy of the original plat map that is stamped and certified by the county. And it specifically says, P.S. Avenue is not dedicated. But the city refuses to acknowledge that. And RCW law 56.10.020, certified copy of plat as evidence. A copy of any city or town plat or addition thereof to recorded in the manner provided for RCW 5810.010, certified by the county auditor of the, of the county in which the same is recorded to be true copy of such record and the whole thereof shall be received in evidence. The whole thereof, you're supposed to read the whole thing and you deny that that exists and you've, you've just raked me over the coals over this. And all the courts of this state with like effect as the original. Officer Tucker refuses to look at it. Officer Carr refuses to look at it. They swore an oath to uphold the, the uh, Constitution. They don't. They, they're supposed to be protecting me with the same laws that they're using against me. It says it in there. Now, the other thing is, did, you, did the city hire Will Hone as an attorney? No. No? Uh, is he an attorney now for us? Is that what you're asking? Well, no. Or? Did they ever hire Will Honey as an attorney? I believe he has. When Aaron Berg was here, he was hired on. We, he worked for us. Yes. This is public records. It is not signed by the city. You, he sent a letter... I could read the whole thing, take me forever. But he sent a letter demanding me to remove my trees, my fence, and everything from this property. Or the city would. And the city did. So I'd take you to small, try to take you to small claims court. It didn't work because the city had code enforcement coming after me for blocking East, the uh, East, Eastern Avenue. So... You have, you have about 30 seconds, Phil. 30 seconds. Um, yeah. It's hard to do up here. Um, so the city, the city has code enforcement come after me for blocking it, and the city has no right to. This, the, this small claims court sent you and me a letter that says this is a land issue, it, it says superior court matter, and that's where it should have went, but you had code enforcement and continued with code enforcement after me, even though you got that letter. It's just wrong. The city is corrupt. I'm a second class citizen. I'm down there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else for public comment? Yes. Uh, yeah, Nate, my name is Joe Burns, and I live at 908 Talcott Street. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to thank the Rotary Club and everyone who's involved in the Pat's Playground. That looks amazing. I really think it's a creative design. Uh, I can't wait until my son's old enough to play on it. Uh, I have a question probably for Mark Freiberger. Uh, people I've talked to in my area have brought up alley maintenance and asked about them uh, putting gravel down, compacting it, as opposed to occasionally coming through with a grater and just smoothing it out, taking care of potholes, because it's gradually over the years making the alley higher and higher, which is causing some of them some uh, issues with fences, things of that nature. Just curious if there was a reason why uh, you were just putting gravel on top, which I'm not necessarily complaining about. It looks great. It's smooth. Um, just wondering if they could uh, save some money and just run a grader through there sometimes, and that'll help slowly knock it down a little bit on elevation. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Burns. Those are good questions. We usually don't answer um, during public comment. However, I know that Mark Freiberger is online here, and I'm sure he took note of that. So Joe Burns, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. he has your contact number, or, or can you contact him? So I can reach out to him. That works. Oh, that would be fantastic. I think he'd appreciate that, and I think he'd be able to answer those questions for you. Okay, great. Thank All you. All right. Thank you, Joe. Okay, and it is now 
let's see here, uh, 648. So I'm going to close public comment and we are going to move on to unfinished business. And um, Nikki, I believe this is you. It has to do with the housing sales tax discussion. Uh, last week or the last council meeting on the 28th, we did bring this forward, but it was tabled. Um, so Nikki. Thank you, Mayor. So as the mayor indicated, this is a continuation of a conversation that um, we had back on July 28th. Um, RCW 82-14-530 authorizes local jurisdictions to impose a sales and use tax that is to be used to support affordable housing. This tax is a one-tenth of one percent use tax. And the city has an opportunity to impose this tax if it would like. It has the ability to do this because the county did not impose the tax before the deadline in 2020. Because of this, the city can impose the tax and keep the control of that money local. The issue here is that the county is very likely to impose this tax. It is currently going through the legislative process and um, is on the cusp of passing passing this tax. If county does that, um, the the city won't have any local control over over the money. It's very likely that the county will enter into an interlocal with the cities that are within the county. And there is a, a draft proposal in the packet that talks about what that might look like. But ultimately, the decision as to how to utilize that money would be, it would belong to the council or the, the, the county council. Um, so the city has a couple of options. Like I said, it can impose this tax within the city and the revenue would then stay local and be controlled by the city. It could decide not to impose the tax. The county will then impose the tax and the city won't have the control, but it will certainly be um, a part of the decision-making process through an interlocal agreement. Um, I, I believe that staff's recommendation is to go ahead and adopt Ordinance 1986-21 and keep the local control. Um, however, it is up to the council. That is a, a decision that council gets to make and it should feel free to engage in um, some dialogue about the options. Okay, are there any questions for Attorney Thompson? What, <clears throat> everything has a cost, so what, how much every year is it gonna cost the city to staff a, this operation and to collect taxes and all that? It's not gonna be free. So have you done any studies of what it's gonna cost the city? No, so actually that's probably a better question for Debbie. Um, this would be, uh, it, it's probably a Debbie question. I'd be happy to respond. Um, Thank you. You bet. So uh, this this tax would be just very similar to the um, all of the sales tax collections that we currently have. All of the record keeping and accounting are done by the state of Washington, and then monthly we would be re, you know receive our um, tax portion for this. So the accounting um, costs and the finance department costs would be very minimal for this program. Um, when you do decide how you want to use the, the money, um, again, it's probably a pretty simple process as well. We would come up with the project that we would be using the money for, and then we would be able to account for that project, just like we do any other project that we currently have at the city. Yeah, but if you do a project, you have to have somebody to control that project, and that costs money, and they have to keep their eye on it. So is, any, is there any idea what it would cost? It's not free. Yeah, I, don't, I do not have a, that type of a, you know, information until we kind of know what type of a project the council would be interested in utilizing the monies for. It is um, challenging to, you know, decide or to inform those costs. Um, and it just also doesn't disallow you from participating in countywide projects, you know, you, that, but you do have the option then of how to use your, your funds. Right, and you, and you could utilize the funds in a manner that you contract for with the county. It's just that you're retaining the control of those funds as opposed to leaving the ultimate decision making um, with the county's <coughs> legislative body. 
Okay, I, I'm not sure here, I th Mr. DeYoung, I think, it, 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 I, I apologize, it's really hard to see the people up on the screen. So I think you have your hand up? You do, okay, thank you, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. DeYoung, we can't hear you. Oh, uh, sorry, um, um, Madam Mayor, uh, I didn't uh, know I was acknowledged, sorry, I didn't hear you there. Council Member DeYoung, uh, I have a question about uh, what is the forecast of the revenue that this tax will bring on an annual basis? Thank you. I'd be happy to answer that. Um, that would be about $279,000 a year with our current activity, um, sales tax activity. Okay, and Councilman McLaughlin, did you have a question? Uh, I did, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Nikki, one of the questions I had was in the county's proposal, they said they would put aside about 5% towards the service costs. Um, is that something that we could look at doing if we retained it locally to help cover the, the cost of running the program and everything? So I heard something about 5%. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not hearing particularly well. You said something about retaining 5%. So in the county's proposal, they mentioned that they would keep a certain percentage uh, to help run the program. Oh, is, it, yes. is that allowed to do for us as well if we keep it? Um, that should be an allowable expense. It has to be related to um, affordable housing, but um, the, the, the administrative costs are something that would be built in to uh, most of those types of projects. Okay. okay. Are there any questions by the council? I have a question, council, Councilwoman Diamond. I would like to know what the parameters are on when a decision would have to be made on what kind of program needs to be created in order to use those funds, because it was not clear. So the first step in this is to, is to go ahead and decide whether or not you want to impose the tax. If you decide to impose the tax, then we would come back and have conversations about what you would want to utilize the revenue for. The revenue isn't going to come in instantaneously. It's going to, um, you know, trickle in slowly. And so um, it's likely that you would want to um, bank the money and, and then come up with a plan of how you're going to utilize it. Debbie, would you agree with that? Yes, and we have some t parameters that we need to meet with the Department of Revenue um, as far as getting this even started. So right now, if tonight you um, make a decision and we would get this to the Department of Revenue, we could start collecting the sales tax as early as October. However, um, otherwise we would then not be able to start collecting the tax until January. Uh, regarding how long we would have to spend the tax, I'll have to, um, th the tax is collected. I believe that's what I understood your question is how long would we have to spend this tax? I am not familiar with any time limit that has been um, set on these monies just the use of these monies. So to go further and look into the future of the whole, the whole project in and of <coughs> itself, if the city was to take on the sales tax, tie its hands to holding on to this, and, and then in all, for all intensive purposes, um, having to put together a project like this, what kind of implications is it going to have on our first responders um, and, and additional staff and services that are necessary to to fund and keep our community moving. I mean, right now we are already uh, seeing excess numbers of residential housing and and other things processed. We've got we've got people that are are you know currently just trying to get things moving and from from a, a budget and finance standpoint, what could we be looking at in the future of having to come up with to continue with the growth, if that makes sense? Because the, the city still has to, has to grow. We have to have enough staff to fund and to process and to take care of all of this stuff, just like Councilman Loy was, was mentioning. Um, but outside of just the people processing it, we also have to look at the, 
the amount of people that are going to serve and, and be able to protect and take care of the, this kind of situation and project in the future, and none of that is free. And so, so that's where my questions kind of are, are leading to and coming from is, is, is there any forecast? I know it, it kind of depends on the project. I, I completely understand that. Um, but without all of those parameters kind of outlined and determined, I'm really struggling with, with the whole concept of, of keeping that money with the city or accepting that from our hardworking taxpayers um, without the clear parameters and not having a long-term forecast. I, I, I'm just not somebody that can accept and, and, and take this first and then come up with the plan second. I don't think that that, that doesn't make sense to me from as, as a taxpayer myself. Can I weigh in on that? Oh, absolutely. So, so um, it isn't a question of whether or not um, your citizens are going to be paying this. The county is going through the process right now. So your citizens are going to be paying this regardless because the county is almost 100% likely to pass this tax. And that's going to include the citizens of Cedar Woolley. Correct. The question isn't whether it's going to happen. The question is who's going to control how the money is used. Correct, but if the city takes it on, does then are are we then respond? We're then responsible in the future for uh, everything that goes on around it. Correct. If the if the county is going to do it and the county puts it in county property, the city's not responsible. If the city does it and it's in in and within the city, we then the it is it is responsible. It doesn't have to be um, city property. That, that's not a requirement. There's um, a, a multitude of things that qualify for this funding, right? You can use it to construct affordable housing. You can use it to construct behavioral and mental health related facilities. You can use it to fund operations and maintenance of new units of affordable housing. You could contract with um, the county to um, make, you know, have the county do a project that utilizes money um, that Cedra Woolley residents generate but you know you have more say in what that project looks like because you have control of the money is this tax they're talking about now is this a county-wide tax that we get a chunk of the whole county-wide it's not just in cedar woolly city limits is it so the the taxes proposed this evening would be just to the city of Cedar Woolley, this would be our portion of the tax. So, so we would, we would get a cut of the, the sale. We'd get a cut of the sales in Cedar Woolley only. Correct. So the, as soon as they're across the city lim city limits, we don't get any part of that. Right, not outside of the county. But do you remember many county residents do come to your community and shop and eat and and spend money. So. Thank you. Mr. DeYoung. Turning off the mute button helps. <laughs> <laughs> you think after a year you figure it out. Uh, Madam Mayor, I move an ordinance uh, number 1986-21, an ordinance of the city of Cedar Woolley, Washington, imposing an additional sales and use tax of one-tenth of one percent for housing and related services as authorized by RCW 82.14.8. 530, adding a new chapter 3.15 to the Cedar Woolley Municipal Code, providing for severability and establishing an effective date. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to accept the tax. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilman. No, and I second. All right, thank you. One more question. Yes, I was just going to say, are there any more questions or discussions? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, Nikki, I just had one more question. Um, if we do accept these funds, are we allowed to partner with the nonprofit uh, for day-to-day -day operations if we fund like the capital infrastructure? Yes, I don't see any reason why you couldn't form some sort of public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. The requirement is that it be used for a specific purpose, but that doesn't mean that um, government entities don't partner all of the time with third-party um, management companies or um, nonprofits. Thank you. Any more questions? 
Uh, yes, uh, Councilman Allen, is there any way if we possibly table this tonight, is there any way you can find out, you know, like if we can partner with Habitat for Humanity or any other organizations like that and get a definitive answer? Well, we already have a motion on the table. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so th that I get an accurate count because I want to make sure that all the council members' vote is counted. I'm going to call out your name and if you could um, either say yes in favor or no, not in favor, um, that, that will record. So I'll begin with um, those who who made the motion. So Councilman DeYoung, is that a yes or no to pass this tax? I made the motion to, um, yes, approve. <laughs> okay. Support, yay. Councilman, um, okay. And Councilman Owen? I approve. Okay. And Councilman Allen? Uh, no. Okay. And Councilman McGoffin? Yes. All right. And Councilwoman Diamond? No. Councilwoman Kesty? No. Okay. And Councilman Loy? No. Okay. So it is a four to three um, declining the nine the um, declining ordinance nineteen eighty six twenty one, the uh, affordable housing tax. So that motion dies. All right. Okay, so moving on. May I interrupt a minute? Now that doesn't mean that we're dead on this. We can we can change our mind down the road, correct? No, I think we're done on this. Are we not? Um, You're dead unless you want to um, move to reconsider. Well, I'm, I'm not. What I'm talking about is <clears throat> if we work to deal with the county or something. Is so there's... your deal with the county is going to. Um, I mean that that's going to look like an interlocal after they've passed their affordable. Okay. All right. I'm happy. Okay. okay. Um, moving on then. So moving on to uh, ordinance 1990-21. And this is a first read. And the question is, the issue is, should we change uh, city supervisor, the name city supervisor, to city administrator? And um, Nikki, you are on again. So this is a first read. Um, this came about as a result of Dr. Merriman putting in his notice of intent to retire. Um, the city of Cedro Woolley is the only city left in the state of Washington that utilizes the title city supervisor. Um, the rest of the cities um, in strong mayor farms of government, they utilize the title city administrator. So um, the city of Cedro Woolley is an outlier and um, that does create issues when you are trying to recruit for a new um, city supervisor. Yes, it is. Because um, the, the city administrators out there don't really know what you're referring to. So uh, the um, recommendation of Prothman and myself and staff is that the council pass an ordinance changing the title of city supervisor to city administrator to be consistent with the rest of the cities in the state. Um, Ordinance 1990-21 does that and changes um, each, each piece of municipal code that references city supervisor to city administrator. Um, this is a first read, so you will see it again at your next meeting, but I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Nikki? If not, we will move on. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the grant application, the approval of um, TIB uh, for the SR9 Township and John Liner McGargyle intersection. Um, Mr. Freiberger, you are on. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, there's actually an item two on there that we might want to address uh, either after this or before uh, for the waste management recycling agreement. Oh, my apologies. Yes, we do have that. Um, so, are both of these yours? They are, aren't they? No, they're not. They are both. Well, I've called on you. Why don't we move forward with this one and we'll go back to waste management? Okay, so 
Uh, tonight is is the uh, long uh, announced um, request for council's approval to authorize the mayor to sign in, uh, the uh, and submit the uh, Transportation Improvement Board Urban Arterial Program grant application for the SR9 Township and John Liner and McGargle Intersection Project. Uh, in my memo, I give you the numbers. Uh, basically, as I mentioned at the last council meeting, I had a an update uh, in progress for the engineer's estimate that's required to go with the grant. Not too surprisingly, the um, the cost went up from the application uh, estimate we had when we submitted the mm -hmm. economic development grant application uh, back in April. Uh, the increase was around $200,000. Most of the story is COVID-19. Uh, the signal system itself, that's the core part of this project, went up by a, about $200,000 by itself. Um, and that's reflecting uh, supply system issues that are directly related to COVID. Uh, we don't expect they're gonna get better uh, due to the fact that uh, they're they're running ten, eight to 10 months behind on their deliveries. And uh, that's just gonna continue for the uh, foreseeable future on signals. So what we've proposed tonight is, uh, and, and the way I've handled that increase is, I've increased the ask uh, for TIB by 75% of that, and then I am recommending that we increase our match uh, proportion by uh, 25%. Uh, it, it works out to about an increase of $54,000 on our match. I have, as I usually do in coordination with Doug and, and Debbie, uh, prepared an update to our arterial funding listing that we do uh, to check whether this is gonna uh, work with our overall funding scheme that we do. Uh, we use funding from the uh, REIT funds. 50% uh, of those go into uh, funding for transportation projects. The uh, Growth Management Act impact fees that we collect on development is eligible for funding uh, this, this kind of project. In fact, that is what it's for. And then we also have some account 104 uh, uh, balance dollars that we use for that uh, as they're available. So between all of those funding sources, we see that this, this increase is a rather minor impact on that. Uh, I have in our arterial project listing, which is attached to the packet, uh, showed the cash flow on that. And basically what we do with that, we allow all of the projects that are in the uh, six-year tip, which you passed a few weeks ago, uh, that we anticipate happening over the next three years with the amount of match dollars we are anticipating for those projects, they're all shown. And uh, in adding this additional money, uh, we also, Doug and I and Debbie looked at uh, where we are at currently with the uh, revenues that have come in for both REIT and the impact fees. And with the uh, existing growth uh, boom, you might say that's going on, they are coming in uh, faster than it's expected. Uh, when Doug first prepared the uh, arterial funding list, he was allowing uh, approximately $60,000 per year for GMA impact fees. We're at about 300 and, and some thousand dollars in that fund uh, to date this year. So we're pretty healthy on that and the REIT funds are also coming in better than expected by about double. Uh, so there's, there's no issue with uh, adding that uh, for this application. And my recommendation is, as we do uh, increase it, my other option would have been to just ask for all the money for, from TIB. I've been uh, working as closely as you can uh, in advance on these with the TIB staff. And uh, our project last year, we, we applied for it at the lower amount. Uh, we were just out of the funding then. Uh, they did fund a signal in Mount Vernon instead of ours in our region, which the main reason I was given that uh, they funded that project where, rather than ours is we were asking for over $2 million and they were asking for less than that. They had some other funding uh, to use on it uh, and they just didn't have enough funds to uh, to award both projects. We're thinking the project will rank uh, okay. Uh, that changes year by year with other projects that come in, uh, but we're thinking that uh, having the match a little bit higher uh, will be important to our success on this. And so that's our recommendation is to just keep the match at 25% and, uh, and submit for the project. 
So there's other uh, information available on the actual ask amount on the second page of the uh, memo. Uh, the TIB ask is slightly higher than $2 million because of the increase. Uh, originally, it would have been about $1.8 million. Uh, but that's about the best I think we can do. I, I, I don't recommend increasing the match artificially just to keep that under $2 million. I think we'll be okay at this level. And so that's our recommendation to you. And I can take any questions you might have on this. Uh, there's actually two parts to the recommendation. Uh, first is to approve the commitment of $427,979 in local funding as matched for the project. And the second one is to authorize Mayor Johnson to sign uh, and the staff to submit the uh, TIB, TIB urban application grant for this project. So, Mr. Freiberger, this is actually considered a first read. Are you needing an answer tonight? Are you looking for a vote tonight? This is not a first read. This uh, this has to be acted on tonight. The uh, grant application is due tomorrow. Well, I think this is the first time that they've seen it. I think it was supposed to be on the agenda last time, but it was not. So, this is the first time that the council has actually seen it. So, I'm just. I guess my question is, do you need do you need an answer tonight? Yes, if we're going to submit the application, we need act we need action on this tonight. And I, I have been raising this as coming your way uh, for several sessions, so uh, it should be should be okay in that way. I was going to say I'm comfortable because I know you've been mentioning it for months, so I've been kind of keeping an eye on it myself. So, are there any questions for Mark, or do you, is there an motion? Well, I think it's a great project. You know, that's quite a, quite a tough spot there in the corner, McGargo and what is it, John Liner and Highway Nine, mm -hmm. and something needs to be done before sooner or later something bad's going to happen. So if if we can afford it, <clears throat> and he has the grants lined up, I think it would be well worth the time. Okay. All right. So I need a motion if that's the case. If the council wants to move forward. <coughs> I'll make a motion that we approve his request. Thank you, Councilman Loy. Do I have a second? second? That. I'm sorry? I will second that. Okay. So um, I have a motion by Councilman Loy, seconded by Councilwoman Diamond, to approve the commitment of the $427,979 in local funding to match the Transportation Improvement Board Urban Arterial Program grant for the SR9 Township and John Liner McGargyle intersection project. Any more discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, motion carries. So we need authorization now. Do we have a motion for the authorization? I'll make the most motion to authorize. Thank you. Do we have second. a second? Second. Okay. Second. So I had a motion by um, Councilman, uh, Councilwoman Diamond, seconded by Councilman McGoffin, to authorize Mayor Johnson to sign and submit the TIB Urban Arterial Program grant application for the SR9 Township and John Liner McGargyle Intersection Project. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Oppo aye. Opposed, same sign. All right, motion carries. Thank you. Okay, moving on then, or back to, I should say, the agreement with wastewater management. And this is um, this was supposed to be Doug's. Again, it's a first read. And Nikki, are you going to cover for Doug regarding this? Yes, thank you, Mayor. So this is a first read, as the Mayor mentioned. Uh, this is uh, our uh, ongoing agreement with uh, waste management to take our um, recycle stream. Uh, basically, it's a three-year agreement. Uh, the exist existing agreement expires on August the 31st of 2021. So we're bringing this to you as a first read tonight, and, and I'll, I'll describe what's in it and take any questions you have. And it'll come back to you again at the second uh, at the uh, meeting on the 25th for your action. Uh, I am hearing from uh, Leo that we do need to act on it if if you are comfortable with it. Uh, no later than that meeting because waste management's taken a position that if we don't have an agreement, they're not going to take our material, uh, period, and uh, we do need to have a way to dispose of this. So as uh, Council Member Loy described, there is an internal discussion uh, regarding uh, the waste uh, recycling uh, program. This is really independent of that. This is just to allow us to continue to operate 
whatever happens with the overall program, this agreement can be canceled. Uh, the clause has the, or the, as most agreements do, it has a clause for notification and cancellation uh, on, on a 30 day notice. So um, basically this particular agreement uh, is proposing an increase of about 11% on the current uh, amount that we pay for recycling. And uh, this will raise our new base rate from, uh, to $186.85. Um, the agreement has provision for an annual adjustment of the rate uh, by the uh, Consumer Price Index for water and sewer and trash collection services. And so that's pretty much something they ex exercise every year. They also have the ability to uh, request an extraordinary rate adjustment that's mentioned in the memorandum there. Uh, they, can, they can do that every 90 days uh, to request actual increased costs or reduced revenue associated with performance of the services under the agreement. Uh, I'm not sure they have done that exactly, but they do have that in place and that would represent something like the market just set plain collapses. And again, if they request that and we decide not to do that, uh, then we do not have to sign on to those things. But then, then the uh, agreement would, uh, would uh, be canceled or, or would end. Uh, there is also a contamination surcharge uh, provision in this. And what that consists of is uh, we, we have a pretty good relationship with our users and they do a good job of separating their recyclables but uh, sometimes we do get a bad load. Uh, waste management has the ability, if they get uh, bad materials, to charge us uh, a surcharge for the extra handling uh, to separate contaminants out of the waste stream. And so they gave an example in their memorandum of what that looks like. And so for instance, if they had a five ton load that was bad enough that they had to reject it and would have to dispose of it in other methodology, they charge us a five, $150 per ton uh, for that additional handling. So for a five ton load that they would have to do that, it would be about $750 that we would get billed mm -hmm. in addition to the uh, base rate that we pay. Uh, I didn't, I neglected to ask Leo if we've had that happen. I think it's pretty rare. Uh, and that is uh, a, a testament to the uh, care that our citizens have been doing. The way waste kind of looks at this is they, they periodically do an audit on the waste stream and they take a look at uh, several loads and separate them out to see how we're doing. And, and we've been doing fine and I, I anticipate that we'll probably continue to do so. So the fiscal impact of this rate increase is estimated between 17 and $18,000. Uh, we'll be uh, factoring this in, of course, in our uh, rate uh, study increase that we'll do a little later this year as we verify the budget. Um, and we'll have to recover that, of course, from, from the rate payers uh, to keep the, uh, the uh, fund solvent. So that's, that's the long and short of the agreement. Uh, it's a three-year agreement. And again, uh, they will have the ability to request CPI increases, which they generally do on an annual basis. I would be glad to take any questions, but again, this is just a first read. I, you'll see it again on the 25th. When you mention the word contaminant, in my language, that means garbage. Is that, would you agree with that? That's exactly what it means. If they, if they throw uh, things that shouldn't be in there that can't be recycled, uh, that's a contaminant. Uh, and uh, yes, it's, it's generally garbage, but it also means that people are putting the wrong kind of things that you would normally think were recyclable. Like, and they had a pretty good list in the back of the agreement if you're curious as to what that consists of. But for instance, clamshells, and my wife and I discuss this all the time. She says, that's number one plastic, that's recyclable. Yes, but it costs them to handle that because they fly all over the place because of their lightweight nature. And so they, they're pretty specific about what they will and won't accept and, and what uh, con uh, conforms to a contaminant. Have, has the city had any of that happen in the past where it was rejected because of contaminant? Uh, you know, and I, I just don't know for sure. That's a, that's a Leo question. Uh, I think it's rare. He's not told me of any incidents of that uh, directly. So I actually asked the question when I was reviewing the contract, 
because I wanted to know how much we were being charged to take it directly to the landfill or, or that they were charging us to deliver to the landfill. And I was told that that, that wasn't something that was occurring. Thank you. Good. Now you mentioned that if the market fell out of the fell out of the sky that they could raise the price. We could in in in, in that in that case we could just cancel the recycle contract and turn it into garbage, correct? You all you, you have that um, ability at uh, in basically any point as long as we adhere to the uh, timeline for cancellation that's in the contract. And is there a penalty for that? There would be no penalty for that um, as long as we adhere to the provisions of the contract. Mr. DeYoung, I see your hand is up. Council Member DeYoung, um, I have a question there, Mark. On uh, We get charged by, or the, I'm sorry, we, uh, when I put out my tote for recycling, I get charged by volume, but the city gets charged by uh, mass. So as an example of that, if I uh, use my tote to fill it up with a bunch of catalogs and uh, flattened tin cans and really got that thing really heavy, it's the same price as if I just bought a refrigerator and I put that refrigerator box into that, into that tote, which still fills the same volume. So is, is, that, still, is that still how we're operating, is uh, not really apples to apples and oranges to oranges? So what they do is, uh, I mentioned before, they audit some loads and so what they do is they periodically will, will take several random loads, and I think it was about five different loads they mentioned in the, uh, in the agreement, and they will check how that averages out. And that's the way they, they, they figure their contract based on that. So uh, you wouldn't be able to get a refrigerator in there. That would actually be a contaminant. Uh, you know, as <laughs> I'm sorry, the box, the cardboard box that it comes in. That Remember work. the thing we used to slide down the hill on? Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, so so they have a way of, of doing that so that uh, they, they're aware of the average tonnage they get out of the loads that we delivered to them. And uh, it, it seems to work out uh, for them. Obviously, it's a business decision on their part. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, any other questions? No. No. If not, we are, we've come to the end of our uh, agenda tonight. Um, I want to thank you all for good discussions, really good discussions. And uh, if there's nothing for the good of the order, um, just a reminder um, that our next Mayor, council meeting is going to be um, August 25th at 6 p.m. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Oh. Oh, Carl's got Go to the order. We have that um, there at the end of our packet about the 8th annual homeless night. So I just wanted to bring people's attention to that. Okay, thank you. We're adjourned. Yes. <laughs> you need a, a, a hammer. There we go. Recording stopped. I may or may not be.